Hello. Welcome to the Dalalana School of Public Health. We've all been hearing a lot about epidemiologic models lately. And if you're watching this, I imagine you have a lot of questions about these models. Like, what are they? Why are we hearing so much about them? And what do they tell us? Epidemiologists like me use models like this every day. Come inside and I'll tell you more. There are many different types of models that epidemiologists use. Most of these are what we call statistical models. However, studying infectious diseases requires a special set of tools, because unlike other diseases, infectious diseases are transmitted between people, animals, or other organisms. This means that the number of infections we see today can help us determine the number of new infections we're likely to see tomorrow. Mathematical models are one tool that can help us do this. There are two general types of mathematical models that you might have seen or heard about lately. The first is often called a dynamic model or a compartmental model. This is because it's based on the idea that we can model rates of movement between different disease states described according to different compartments. The most basic compartmental model is called the SIR model, which describes movement between susceptible, infected, and recovered disease states. These have been used since the 1920s, and there's lots of calculus behind them that we won't get into. But the important thing to know is that these models consider what we already know about a disease and make some assumptions to investigate factors that may influence the spread of the disease and create hypothetical scenarios to determine the potential long-term impact of different public health measures. Now, you might be thinking, the real world is a lot more complicated than these simple compartments. And you're right. We can use more complicated methods and add more features to make these models better reflect the real world. However, in any case, they still require that we simplify complex real-world systems, so it's important to consider any assumptions and limitations of these models when you interpret their findings. The second type of model you've probably heard about is called a forecasting model. These models essentially make use of the grade school math you probably thought you'd never need. And if you recall the term exponential growth, well, this is what's commonly used for forecasting. In contrast to the compartmental models we just spoke about, forecasting models are best suited for estimating the number of new cases we can expect to see in the coming weeks. So they use the observed data to make short-term predictions. You'll notice that the forecast becomes less certain the further in the future we look. And this is especially true when looking at a pandemic situation or a novel disease, where events are quickly evolving, there's much uncertainty, and the data are scarce. It's important to note that all epidemiologic models are only as good as the data informing them. And for a new disease like COVID-19, there's a lot that we currently do not know and our data are limited. It's also important to note that the local context of the disease matters. For example, a model created in the context of Canada is gonna use data specific to a Canadian population and make certain assumptions that reflect that population. So it might not necessarily be appropriate to take that model and apply it to a different context, such as the Congo, for example. As we learn more and collect more data, this will allow for better informed models. And it's important that these models are created with the context of the population for which they'll be used in mind. Okay, let's look at an example of how these mathematical models could be used to inform public health decision making. In this example, we're going to use a compartmental model. And we're going to start with what we'll call our baseline scenario. So in this scenario, no public health measures are taken to prevent the spread of illness. And this model would suggest this is what we can expect to see in terms of the number of new cases over the coming months. Let's look at a second scenario. In this scenario, people are asked to take a special precaution to prevent the spread of illness. Perhaps that means wearing a face mask, better hand hygiene, or physical distancing. As we might expect, the model would suggest that we'll see fewer number of cases under this scenario. This is one simple example of how a mathematical model could be used to inform decision making by identifying which public health measures are likely to have the greatest impact. That was a really simple example. 
But in actuality, mathematical models are regularly used to inform public health decision making. This is particularly true when more traditional methods, such as a randomized control trial, are not ethical or feasible. For example, mathematical models are regularly used to inform the selection of optimal vaccination strategies and the timing of vaccines. It's important to keep in mind that these models are simplifying complex real-world systems. And the most complicated aspect of all is human behavior. It can be very challenging to anticipate behavioral changes and incorporate these into mathematical models. And in fact, what we often end up seeing happen is that these modeling studies themselves can actually influence and cause behavioral changes. You might have seen with the current COVID-19 pandemic and recent Ebola epidemic that many modeling studies initially projected that we would see a very large number of cases. These large numbers startled people like you and I into taking behavioral changes. They also influenced governments into taking actions that would prevent the spread of illness. So this is one of many reasons why what we ended up seeing was a much smaller number of cases than what was initially projected. Does this mean that these models are wrong or not useful? Not at all. Remember, these models are not actually trying to make predictions for what will occur. They're just tools for informing decision-making as well as possible, especially when a lot is unknown and decisions need to be made quickly, such as in the case of a novel pandemic. If you've ever watched a science fiction movie or read a sci-fi book, chances are you've heard of the ideas of multiple realities, parallel universes, or time travel. This is how I like to think about mathematical models. They let us peer into many different potential futures, and this can help inform our choices today. Assuming we use this insight appropriately, we'll probably actually never see those realities. Whew, all right, that was a lot to cover in a short amount of time. The important things to recall are that mathematical models are not crystal balls. They don't attempt to and are not able to tell us exactly what the future holds. However, mathematical models can still provide important information for informing good decision making, especially when urgent decisions need to be made and there's a lot that we don't know. For example, they can help us identify factors that we should focus our efforts on. As infamously said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. This means that you shouldn't put too much stock into any one model, but that models in general can still be very useful. It's also important to remember that all models are simplifying complex real-world systems. This means they have certain assumptions and limitations that you need to consider when interpreting their findings. 